You know, we've been in prayer and fasting and, and study all day just for you so that you will get the prophetic word, become strong in God and go forward into your destiny because this program has been designed with your destiny in mind. Today, I want us to open our Bibles, but before we do that, we would never attempt to begin to teach scripture uh, without prayer. And I want to welcome all of you. This will be a little bit different method of teaching than what you may be accustomed to if you join us on a regular basis. Tonight is going to be Torah. We're going to be studying in preparation for the power of Passover, some of the messianic mysteries that are hidden in the book of Exodus. And we're going to be looking tonight at scriptures that are going to show us the type of deliverance that you will be experiencing as you follow with us in the next few days and weeks. Next week is a week that we all as Christians look so forward to. It is the week that we celebrate the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. So in preparation for those great and glorious days ahead, as we look forward to the, to the resurrection and also to the great coming of Christ, we are preparing these particular teachings just for you. And I believe tonight you're gonna to be delivered. So let us begin. Heavenly Father tonight, we did not come here to see man or hear man. We have come here tonight to lift up the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. We ask, Lord, that as these words go forward, that you would direct them right into the hearts of those, your children who are hurting, your children who need a miracle, your children who are believing you for the impossible tonight. And particularly, Lord, we together all over the world that are watching this, Facebook Live, we are praying together for one another. I want you, before I even begin, pray for someone you may not know that's viewing at this very moment who needs a miracle or needs a deliverance. That tonight, that by viewing, they're gonna get delivered, they're gonna get set free. Those, Father, who need miracles in their heart, their children to come home, those who need financial breakthroughs, those who just feel so dry spiritually, those who need direction to know which way do I go, those who need divine favor, we pray for one another right now. We're just praying for each other in this big, huge family and this wonderful church without walls tonight. We're praying for one another in Jesus' mighty name and everyone said amen and amen. Let's begin now with the book of Exodus. Beloved people, we are going to start tonight in Exodus chapter 1. Yesterday, if you were with us, and by the way, those of you who viewed us online, we want to thank you. But when it went to post, some, there was a tremendous error. But we're praying that tonight it's going to be all the way for us so that we can really get the fullness of God's word. Tonight we are ha a continuing with the theme, a Yitzerat Mitzarim. Mitzrayim. Say it with me. Yitzerat Mitzrayim. All right, meaning leaving Mitzrayim or leaving Egypt. For those of you that have never heard of such a concept before, what does it mean leaving Egypt? Does it mean I get my passport and I go through passport control and actually leave the country of Egypt? Or is it something more than that? Well, what I want you to know tonight is Yitzerat Mitzrayim literally means leaving physical Egypt, leaving spiritual Egypt, leaving emotional Egypt, leaving Egypt in the soul. Because you can leave physical Egypt, but Egypt can still be inside of you. So tonight we're praying for deliverance. And as we study, because next Wednesday night is Passover, and we want everyone to experience Passover, a personal, powerful, prophetic Passover in your own life, that you come out of Egypt and come into your promised land. Now, yesterday we had spoken about the making of a people of greatness. And we had spoken to you uh, yesterday. If you be, remember, we, we studied the book of Exodus and it begins with the Hebrew letter Vav. And that Vav is very important. Vav is a connecting component. It connects the book of Exodus to the prior book, which is the book of Barashit or the book of Genesis. Meaning that we cannot interpret the book of Exodus as a singular, a singular insular um, entity by itself. That what is in the book of Genesis is continuing. And there are certain things in the book of Genesis that are absolutely essential 
for our understanding of the book of Exodus. And here we understand, dear people of God, that one of the greatest uh, pr primary principles in the book of Exodus is the making of a nation. Not only Mitzrat, Yitzrat, Mitzrayim, which literally means leaving Egypt. And that word Mitzrayim literally means, it's taken from the Hebrew word Metzar, which means narrow place. Some of us feel like we're in a narrow place. We just can't get out. We know there's destiny inside of us. We know God has ordained more for our lives than what we're currently experiencing. But for some of us, it's even more than that. Some of us have more than just a desire to break out of where we are and get to the next level. But there are some of us that are viewing tonight that you can say, well, I've been trying to break out of this place for 10 years. Or some of you say, I can just trace it all my life that since I was a child, things continually happened in a certain area. Maybe it's a spirit of rejection. Or maybe it is things that just keep repeating. We start to get ahead and the cycle goes right on again. It's like there's a block. Every time we start to go to the next level, we're stopped. And we can't really figure out why. Sometimes we say, you know what? I had the right skills. I had the right resume. I don't understand why this door has been blocked in my life. Or maybe it's just spiritually. We say, God, why can't I ever get to the place where I'm longing for you to feel that anointing like I desire to feel? So tonight, there are various different types of Mitzrayim. And tonight, the good news is we're leaving Mitzrayim. Can we give God the praise? Can you say, hallelujah, I'm leaving this narrow place. I'm breaking out of the borders. I'm breaking out of the bondage. I'm going to the place that God has ordained for my life. All right. Now, beloved, making of a people of greatness. This is what God promised Abram. We saw this yesterday in, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. When the Lord called Abram, he said, and I will make your name great and I will make of thee a great nation. All right, Genesis 12 verse two says, I will make of thee a great nation. At this point, Abram had no seed and to make a great nation would have literally been impossible. You know, God always tells us promises that are impossible for us to accomplish in our natural realm. And if you're waiting for you to get all the natural abilities to make it happen, you can just keep waiting and waiting. Because when God performs a miracle, it's really a miracle. That means you had nothing to do with it except participate with God in the areas that he's asking you to participate in. You see, a miracle requires something that's impossible. Sometimes little miracles occur all day long, little impossibilities that God does for us, and we overlook those. But then in this glorious month of Nisan on the biblical calendar that we're actually experiencing, this is a month of continuous miracles, all right? And miracles are not just hidden miracles, which seem coincidental, but there are also open miracles. And every one of the patriarchs of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were given a promise. And that promise was that they were going to have multiple descendants. As multiple uh, descendants, as multiple as the stars of the heaven and the sand of the seashore. There's just one little problem. Uh, Abraham's wife, Sarah, she was barren. And guess what? Isaac's wife. Rebecca, she was also barren. And guess what? Jacob's wives, both Leah and Rachel, were both barren. But later, the Almighty opened the womb immediately of Leah. So we need to understand, why did God possibly say, I'm going to make a huge, huge nation, uh, greater than the stars of the heaven and the sand of the seashore. But we immediately start out with a huge challenge, an impossibility. Because you see, we serve the God of the impossible. And God wants you to know that your destiny is not based on what? Just what you can do, who you can meet, how many good names you can put in for yourself, wherever it is. God wants you to know he's the one who's the door opener. He's the one who's going to do it for you. So if we follow the pattern of Abraham, we are surely going to enter into those doors of destiny. Now we are seeing, beloved saints, that 
God told Abraham, I will make of thee a great nation. Then we see that when Jacob was going down to Mitzrayim, the Bible tells us that at many hundreds of years later, actually a hundred and something years later, as Jacob was going to Mitzrayim at a time of famine, just like Abraham went into um, Egypt in a time of famine. Now Jacob is going down in a time of famine to Mitzrayim. And God gives him a dream. And God said, Israel, Israel. And he said, here am I. And God said to him, fear not to go down to Mitzrayim, for there I will make of thee a great nation. So God had ordained that in the fiery furnace of affliction, through great trials, tribulations, and hardship, the nation of Israel would not be born in the land of Canaan, that the nation of Israel would be born in slavery in the land of Egypt. So what does this teach us? This teaches us that, first of all, in the darkest, deepest, most grievous time of your life, death, destiny is being birthed out. You know, you may say, this is the most grievous test I've ever gone through. Maybe it was something that you don't even understand, a dark day, a, a time of trial, a time of tribulation. But God wants you to know, no matter how dark your situation, God is able to bring divine multiplication, just like he did for the children of Israel when they were in Mitzrayim. And God chose that the nation would be born under very difficult, grueling circumstances, under backbreaking labor. This is how the nation of Israel was born. And oftentimes we don't understand what God's doing when we're going through trials and tests, but this is how our destinies are born. All right, so we saw yesterday that the Bible tells us that the nation of Israel was actually born in the midst of a dystopian society. You know, a dystopian society is a, is a society that is built upon um, continual suffering, uh, imposing suffering upon their people. A dystopian society is oftentimes born from totalitarianism. And it is born from um, control. It is born from oppression. It is born from um, tremendous wrongs that are done to the individuals through oppression and through various forms of regression. And we want to see something here as we begin to study uh, Exodus chapter 1, because we are going to see that the lethal repression that was placed, placed upon the B'nai Israel, the children of Israel by Pharaoh, was really a masterminded plan. Pharaoh felt that the children of Israel were a tremendous threat to his society because he saw greatness in them, all right? And if we look at it and if we study it, we are going to understand, dear people of God, that this particular type of repression that is going to come upon the children of Israel is going to be masterminded. And the only thing we can compare it to is Adolf Hitler. Because when we begin to look at the Holocaust and begin to examine the Holocaust and how the Holocaust actually began, it began very similar to the way that Pharaoh engineered the repression and the oppression over the children of Israel through a plan, a plan that was used during the time of the Holocaust that made the people by which Adolf Hitler was mesmerizing with his lies and with his words, making it appear that the Hebrew people were the purpose of all pain, all suffering, all injustice, and all types of lies that are definitely shown to us in the final solution written by Adolf Hitler and also in Mein Kampf. So we need to understand that the propaganda at the time of the Holocaust and even before the Holocaust officially began on Kristallnacht, we need to understand that there was constant um, propaganda that was going forth from one of Hitler's key propagandists, 
from the magazine that he had designed, Julia Stryker, in the um, Nazi-engineered um, SS magazine that was written to continually um, uh, propagandize the population of Germany and to continually make the people believe that their problems in society were caused from one people alone. And this is exactly what, hit, what, what Pharaoh did. Look at the plan of Pharaoh. The Bible tells us here, and he said to his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we, as if they are a problem to our society. And they are going to now be a cause for certain social issues that we're going to have in the land of Egypt. For the Bible says, For the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it come to pass that they shall join together with our enemies. Oh, what kind of a foolish statement is that? That they will come and join together with our enemies and fight against us and get them up out of the land. Now, if we compare the words of Pharaoh with some of the magazines put out by Julius Stryker, then we will understand that this is very similar, that the ones who are actually victimizing the people and oppressing the people with this tremendous amount of oppression, now through their propaganda, are causing the entire society of the Egyptian people to believe with a mindset because the actual whole entire plan that Pharaoh had in his programmatic genocide, very similar to Adolf Hitler in his programmatic genocide, was to be able to cause the masses of people to believe that the problem was the Hebrew people and that the only solution would be to put an end to their lives. And this is why his plan of genocide began to be put into action through the killing of Hebrew children. All right, we cannot ignore this during the time of Passover. We cannot pass it by. We cannot just say, whoop de doo we're coming out of Egypt. We need to take a moment and realize that um, when we hear something, and as people, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to be able to evaluate the facts, all right? So here we see this repressive society beginning, and now Pharaoh, through his programmatic genocide that he has begun, through his propaganda, making all of Egyptians think, think that the biggest problem to our society is the Hebrew people, that now they begin to work together, and there's oppression on every level. He begins with Pharaoh himself oppressing the people. Then he sets over them taskmasters, very similar to SS. Okay, he sets over them taskmasters to afflict them with burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Petom and Ramses. But the Bible says the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Here we see the people of greatness bursting out through all of this repression. And God wants you to know that a people of greatness, when greatness is inside of you through God, through his word, through his commandments, through our Lord Jesus Christ, it does not matter what is coming up against you. You and I need to understand that no matter what tries to stop you, you're still going forward. I want you to stay, say this with me, unstoppable. Can you just raise your hands right now wherever you are, whoever you are, even if you're, you know, at, at your kitchen and if you're in your bedroom, if you're, you know, walking, listening, uh, watching your phone while you're watching this, just say unstoppable. Okay, because God wants you to know that if you are determined for destiny tonight and if you are a person that knows what God has promised you, you can't be unstoppable unless you know the promises of God. But if you know those promises, then you know that God is faithful and no matter what the enemy tries to do to you, you are going to go forward. You are unstoppable in the name of Jesus. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. So here we see supernatural multiplication in the midst of all their devastation. God is able to multiply you. 
All right, so now let's look just for a moment and see some of this programmatic genocide and how it actually worked. And this is written not so you know it happened. You know, the Bible is not written just so we get a great and wonderful, especially the Hebrew scriptures, so we get this great and wonderful encyclopedic um, version of history. No, the Bible is written because it's personal, powerful, prophetic, and relevant just for you. Did you know that God, everything in the Bible that is written, is, is currently relevant for everything in life? Not everything that all the prophets said are recorded. Only that which, uh, which uh, divine providence wanted all of posterity throughout the ages to know, which is inspired word of God for future, not just for then, but for future, all right? So not everything that prophet Isaiah ever said, not every conversation is recorded, not every conversation of Jeremiah is recorded, only prophecies that are pertinent, that are going to go forward into the future, that affect every generation. This is the inspired word of God, and it's without error. It's inerrant. That means it's sharper than any two-edged sword. So we have to honor God's word and know we're not reading history, even though it is historical. We are reading something personal and relevant for our lives right now. So God is speaking to you as well as he is telling telling us what happened in this narrative, this slavery narrative. He is also telling us about your life and about bondages breaking off of your life and about your future, all right, and about going forward into your future. All right, so here we see, dear people of God, I want you to see this. The Bible says here, the more they, they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. So first of all, in Pharaoh's plan, and in his plan, he's going to inculcate the entire Egyptian society. He's already brainwashed them in their plan to, as a society, realize the biggest problem here is these people. All right, we need to get rid of them. We need to uh, oppress them. We need to stop them because what they're doing is they're taking over our land. All right, this is very similar to what Adolf Hitler did. And now we're going to see he's going to do this on three levels. First, he's going to assign taskmasters. Level one is Pharaoh himself. Level two is the taskmasters. And level three is the Egyptians themselves. So we see three levels of subjugation that are in complete unity together, working together, who have been completely brainwashed. All right. And in this process, they together as a unit are oppressing God's people. All right. So here we see that they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Petom and Ramses. This is where the slavery narrative is actually beginning. Now, if we had a map in front of us and we were to look at the map of Egypt, we would, most of us are very familiar with some of the traditional pictures of pyramids that we have seen in Egypt. And we see dry, desertous land. We see flat land that looks just like a flat plain, basically made of rock, worth tons and tens of thousands of tons of brick are built up in these edifices made by slaves. For example, where the Sphinx are today, we see flat land that is, um, um, in, a, in a geological sense, able to hold the many thousands of tons of bricks and to be able to be structured and engineered in a proper way that the land can hold it. But I want you to know something. The scripture here mentions two cities, Pitom and Ramses. So if we were to look on the map and look up the location of Pitom and Ramses, we would notice it is not like it is today when you come into Egypt and you look where the Sphinx are and we see where the Sphinx are located. No, not at all. Where is Pitom and Ramses? Pitom and Ramses is located in Upper Egypt in the marshland. The marshland has 
land that is swamp land. Okay, it is land that in a geological sense, any engineer is going to tell you there is no possible way we can build a pyramid here. It'll just sink right through the ground. We can't possibly put tens of thousands of bricks on this marshland we will not be able to sustain, the weight will not be able to sustain the type of soil and the type of ground. We need brick, we need flat ground, we need stone, we need earth that will be able to hold these tons of bricks. So why did Pharaoh do this? Pharaoh didn't do this for an industrious purpose, to build himself Egypt in its glory. Pharaoh did this out of cruelty. Pharaoh did this because he wanted to brainwash the children of Israel and make them feel that in the midst of their slave labor, they were not producing any profit. That they would work and they would slave, they would work and they would slave. Even a person, no matter what they're doing, God created every human being with a certain uh, fulfillment, a certain level in your soul, a certain foundation in your soul, a certain aspect in your soul that needs to feel pleasure, all right? There's no such thing as a human being that is unable to experience pleasure. God created your soul to be able to experience pleasure. Some forms of pleasure are very warped and it's not really pleasure. It's just some kind of a sickness, all right? But the real human being was created by God, the real human soul rather, was created by God to experience pleasure. A mother experienced pleasure when she holds her baby. A little girl, for the first time, experiences pleasure when her daddy holds her and tells her she's beautiful. Um, a, a mother, when she's looking at her little baby, she just strokes its little head. The baby receives pleasure. The mother receives pleasure, all right? Um, a little child, when he makes his mommy for the first time, a little, a little drawing, and he comes and says, Mommy, Mommy, look what I made. There's a sense of pleasure that is in accomplishment, in work. No matter what your work is, whether your work is a work that maybe in the eyes of man may not seem like some great, glorious type of employment, but there's always a sense of pleasure when we do it well. There's always a sense of pleasure. You see, God says, I created you to always excel, no matter who you are. And did you know you're not limited by what society says your work has to be? Let's use Joseph for an example. Joseph was brought down to Egypt, all right? The Bible tells us that Joseph was kidnapped. He was the, one of the first victims in the Bible of human traffic. He was brought down, trafficked, brought down to Egypt, made a uh, purchased for 20 pieces of silver by his own brothers, all right, uh, trafficked him. The Ishmaelites purchased him. They brought him down and he was trafficked again. He was bought by Potiphar, all right? And the Bible says he was brought down twice in Genesis 39, verse 1. The text uses the word, and he was brought down, and he was brought down. All right, so literally when the text is repeating itself, saying he was brought down, he was brought down, literally he went down to the lowest level in his life. There is no other level lower than where Joseph went. He was trafficked, he couldn't speak the language, he was brought out of his own home, his own family, he was brought to a foreign nation, people are not speaking his language, the place is filled with idolatry. This is quite different and quite a culture shock compared to the home of Jacob. But yet, the Bible says that as he was bought as a slave, the Bible says, and the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. Wait a minute. How in the world can a human being become prosperous when you've just been trafficked and brought down and now you're a quote-unquote slave in that position? We have two types of slavery. We have one that is a slave, a group of people that are being controlled by Pharaoh. And then we have Joseph. Joseph, who's also a slave, but you know what? The, the bondage that the children of Israel were under was not upon Joseph. And you know what? It couldn't hold Joseph back from being the best 
at where he was. Joseph began to be a creator right where he was. He began to work in the field and he was so great in the field in what he did that Potiphar immediately said, I can't have this young man in the field. I've got to bring him into my house. And as soon as he came into the house, my gosh, Joseph was so industrious. He was so excellent at what he was doing. At what he was doing was so well and so excellent and so skilled and so perfect that Potiphar was amazed that he said, everything in my house is going to be in your hand. So that immediately he became the steward of Potiphar. You see, we're not limited by the type of work we have. We can still have what maybe we may not think is the best job in the world. But if we practice Torah values, we can be the best at what we're doing. And the Bible says Joseph was a successful man. Nothing could stop his, his success, not being a slave, not adversity, nothing. And I want you to know nothing can stop you from your success. Once you have said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, it doesn't matter what you're doing, just excel at what you're doing. God has called us to be people of excellence. God has called us to be people that will do the best at what we're doing. Doing. All right, but Pharaoh brainwashed the people into believing this is who I am. Pharaoh brainwashed the people into thinking this is there's no hope. We can't produce. We can't even be slaves. Our, our bricks are falling apart, you see. All right, so the Bible tells us in the very next verse, and we need to look at it, verse 13. This is an extremely important component. The Bible tells us here in verse 13. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor and made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and brick and in all manner of service of the field wherein was all their service wherein they were made to serve. Now I want you to see this before I wrap this up tonight. All right, notice the Bible is telling us in all manner of service in the field wherein they were made to serve was with rigor. I want you to see it again. The Egyptians, notice now the text has changed from the taskmasters to the Egyptians because this is programmatic genocide moving throughout the entire country. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel, the scripture says, to serve with rigor. This word rigor doesn't mean elbow grease. It means perek. Okay, perek is a type of work. It is the type of work that you might compare to what was done in the concentration camps. You see, in the concentration camps, there was no purpose in making them work. There was no purpose in carrying bricks from one place to another. There was nothing that they were going to build to be successful or look beautiful. This was for no purpose at all, all right? And there are some types of work that is imposed upon us that doesn't produce any profit at all. There is some work sometimes that we engage in that, that God says it has no purpose. This is a vote of okay? This is exactly what the children of Israel were subjugated to because the great deliverance and liberation and Yeshua that is going to come to the people of God physically is the deliverance from a vote of God is saying, I did not create you to work and not see any profit out of it. I did not create you to be creators, to be able to build, to be able to engineer, to be able to create, to be able to write, to be able to dream, to be able to sing, to be able to engage in something that I have created you to do, creative work, Malacca. I created you for Malacca. I did not create you for a vote of parrot. Okay, a vote parrot, a vote parrot comes from control, and some of us right now are under that bondage of a vote parrot. We're working for something that's never going to produce profit. In other words, we might be working to try to please somebody, and you know what? That pleasure is never going to come. They're never going to be pleased, no matter what you do. And we have to face the facts. Okay, there may be someone that we, there may be someone out there that says, you know, I've been trying to please this person in my life for 30 years. I sold this, I sold that, I do what they want me to do, I've tried to do it, 
And of course, we always want to live for others and not live for ourselves. Selflessness is a Torah value. It is something all Christians long to do, long to go forward to, because Jesus is gives us the power and the love to lay down our lives one for another and to be selfless. However, this doesn't mean the type of control and manipulation where we become like approval addicts, where no matter what we do, if we get up at three in the morning, if we go to bed at midnight and we work 24 seven, or we try to do everything and, and persons put types of bondage on us, say you can't look this way, you can't say that, you can't do this, you walk on eggs and anything you do could displease this person. This is the type of a voter parent, all right? And God wants his people free from it. All right, God wants us to be able to live our lives, to be who he created us to be, and not be something. Of course, we live for others, and of course, we become, our goal is to become like Jesus, but this is not some kind of control and some kind of manipulation, such as the Savota Peric that was, um, that was inculcated upon the children of Israel while they were in the fields. Okay, so rigor, a vote parrot means that I'm laboring and laboring and never see anything for the purpose of it. So they began to cry out to God because their human spirits were broken. And parak is also a word for breaking apart. You see, they began to break apart. And this is actually a psychological word that is used by psychologists. When a person is at the breaking point and they begin to disassociate, they begin to black out their memories. They begin to become so traumatized that they can't remember what's going on. And this type of bondage, these taskmasters and these Egyptians were so traumatizing the children of Israel that all they could do, they couldn't even talk anymore. All they could do was cry and sigh unto God because it was so deep all right so they began to break apart all right and the scripture tells us in all manner of and and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar in brick and in all manner of the field wherein they were made to serve was with Perak. all right what happens the redemption besides the spiritual redemption, is now a redemption of labor. It's a redemption of work. God says, you worked for Pharaoh, but now you're going to work for me. And I am not a taskmaster. God says, I want, first of all, for your creative abilities to come forth. And God is saying, now that you have you are knowing me and you are loving me because God had to reveal himself to the children of Israel when they're coming out because they didn't really know him. They only knew his, barely knew his name. They didn't know where he was. Uh, Moses is going to introduce him and he's going to show his power through, through 10 machok, which are the plagues. So that when the children of Israel are coming out of Egypt, God is now showing them, you're not coming out now. I'm going to do something. Before you leave, I'm going to redeem your old labor. Before you leave, we have to settle some accounts. All these years, it was a vote of Perak. But now that you are mine, I'm going to show you what I'm going to do with those years of tears. They're not going to be wasted. I'm going to show you what I'm going to do with all those years that nothing, no, no profit came out of your pain, nothing came forth except tears. You had nothing to show for it. Before you leave Egypt, I'm going to cause some divine compensation for all your tribulation. And guess what? The Lord promised and he said, Every person, every woman is going to borrow of her neighbor jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and you're going to put it on your sons and your daughters and you're going to spoil the Egyptians so that when the children of Israel left Egypt, they're leaving with silver, they're leaving with gold, they're leaving with raiment, they're leaving with substance as God told Abraham many hundreds of years before your seed is going to serve a nation that is not theirs and afterward i will judge that nation and they shall come forth with great substance so they're coming out of egypt with riches why because these riches are a sign your labor's been redeemed all right and god wants you to know no matter what you've been through in this life 
No matter how many tears, no matter how many trials you have ever gone through in your life, God, the God that you serve, is able to take those tears and turn them into treasures. God is able to take that pain and use it to train for greatness in your future. God has called you to be a person. As you turn your life over to him, nothing's going to be wasted. Even those years you said, gosh, I wish I would have done things differently. Why did I get with that person? Or you say, why did I choose that crazy job? Or why did I go to school at that crazy school? I don't feel like I got anything accomplished. Well, I want you to know the moment you surrender everything to the Lord and the moment you allow him to take you out of that bondage, one of the miracles of Passover, and it's a messianic miracle because through Yeshua HaMashiach, we're coming out. God wants you to know that he's going to take everything you've gone through and use it for his glory. Many of you in this season... For the tears that you have shed, God is about to open doors of destiny. Many of you never thought you're going to be in the place you're going to be. God is going to open doors so wide for you. You have no idea what God has for you. And you're going to say, how did I get here? And you're going to realize that it's part of the redemptive process. That God is redeeming your labor. Because that is one of the great miracles of Passover. Beloved people, I invite you next Wednesday night to join us for our Messianic Passover service. I believe there's going to be so many deliverances. There is going to be prayer and fasting for days before. It's going to be so glorious. And if tonight you have watched this Facebook Live production just in our homes because we can't leave, I want you to know Jesus Christ loves you. He has his hand on you right now. Some of you are pretty much at a breaking point that are watching this. Some of you are saying, God, I just, I'm so tired of everything. God, some of you might have said, Lord, I just give up today. I want you to know, don't give up. Do you know that Jesus loves you so much? He died on the cross for you. And if you have never made him, the true Lord of your life. I mean sold out. You can do that right now. Your life will take a turn. Your life will be changed. Jesus Christ wants to be your very best friend. He'll be there with you through thick, through thin. He is a shelter in the time of storm. You can say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Wash me clean from my sins. I ask you tonight to come into my heart. Wherever you are, whatever country you're watching this Facebook Live in, you can ask Jesus right now to be the Lord of your life and you can ask him to forgive your sins. You know, forgiveness of sins, remission of sins, once and for all, remission of sins is available when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. There is a difference between remission of sins and forgiveness of sins. Remission of sins means God no longer puts it on the account against us. And God makes us a new creature in Christ Jesus. Forgiveness of sins is something that when we become aware of a shortcoming, as Christian believers, and we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ the righteous. And if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So these are two different things, remission of sins and forgiveness of sins. Tonight, I ask you to raise your hands right now. Receive Jesus into your heart as your Savior. Become born again. Receive a brand new nature to serve him with from this day forward. Amen and amen. And I also want to take this opportunity to invite you to be an end time wealth distributor. You say, Dr. Carell, I'm not wealthy. Well, I want you to know something. The Bible tells us that we can turn even the two cents we may have or the dollar that we have or the $25 that we have and make it wealth. You say, how does that happen? Doesn't mean you may have $10 million in a two months. You could, but to make an investment, an investment in Hesed. Hesed is loving kindness. 
taking responsibility for another person, even when you yourself need to be taken care of. You know, taking the responsibility is something called Aribut, and God wants us all to participate in it. And when we do it, there are blessings that God brings in our lives. Barachot over our finances. God wants to bless you, especially at this time of Passover and especially at this time of resurrection. He wants to bless you exceedingly and abundantly. You can be part of our uh, feeding initiatives, global initiatives all over the world where we feed children every day in the countries of Uganda, the countries of Philippines. We feed them in India. We take care of educating children in India, in Pakistan, and many different places of the world. You can be part of that by joining tonight and also by saying, Lord, thank you for this Torah class. Thank you so much for this word. It's changed my life. I want to invest in it because Torah studies and investing in the word of God is a great investment. So we're not only blessing ourselves, but we're blessing others. We're multiplying our dividend here because we're giving to the feeding programs all over the world. We're making a wise investment and we're becoming an end time wealth distributor. Make a statement of faith tonight by saying, I'm not just gonna live on, um, on just what I bring in. I'm going to tonight live not on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I'm gonna make an investment for the kingdom. And if you want to do that tonight, you can do it on two different platforms. First of all, you can do it by going to our website and you can see on the comments, the website is breathofthespirit.org. And as you go on breathofthespirit.org, you can push the donate button and you can sow your seed tonight. Thank you so much for doing that. Or you can text. If you prefer the platform of texting, you can text 77977 and a two hesed, C-H-E-S-E-D. You can see that on the comments also. So it is, you can text to 77977-2-HESED-C-H-E-S-E-D. I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. And also, I want to just kind of, can I just be real personal with you right now? I want to introduce to you my two beautiful granddaughters. And I want you to meet them, so can we just give them an applaud? This is Gia and Paloma. They're coming over. This is Gigi. Some of you know her. And my Omi. Omi. We call her Omi Omi O. <laughs> and these are my two beautiful granddaughters. They've been raised in the ways of God their whole life. And girls, um, first of all, I'm so proud of you both because you both work on so many wonderful initiatives changing the world. This is where it's the young people that God is raising up in this hour. But tell us some of the things that are coming up in the ministry. Yes, so this Friday night, if you've ever wondered what your dreams mean and if your dreams are from God, this Friday night is an incredible service. Paloma, what time does that, that service start on Facebook Live? Facebook Live this Friday night, this Friday, April 3rd, 8 p.m. And we're going to be talking about, or my grandmother is going to be talking about, I will speak to you in a dream. So if you've ever had dreams, you can understand what is the purpose, what is the meaning behind these dreams through scriptural evidence, through understanding what those dreams mean. This Friday night, 8 p.m., Facebook Live. Let's do it. Yes. Yes. All right. Tell us what else, Gigi. Yes. Yeah, so next week, we have an incredible week as we prepare ourselves for Easter and the Resurrection Sunday. And um, as my grandmother, Dr. Michelle Crow, was saying, on Wednesday, we have the power of a personal Passover. And that's Wednesday, April 8th, right here again on Facebook Live, Church with No Walls. And uh, you can tune in at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So that is amazing. And you can register online through our Facebook event so you get updated on all of um, the information as to when we will be going live. And on Good Friday, this is incredible. It's gonna be such a powerful day and we don't want you to miss any of these sessions. So we actually have a few sessions lined up on Good Friday so we can just keep continue. My grandmother, Dr. Michelle Perel, is gonna to continue to impart to you the word that she has received from the Lord. So first and foremost, at 3 p.m., we're gonna be going live, giving the exculpatory evidence 
and the illegal trial of Jesus. So that is going to be incredible. Healing scriptures and devotions on Good Friday. Again, Facebook Live right here at Dr. Michelle Corral. Also, at 8 p.m. on that night, uh, for those believing God for your miracle, join us. Again, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for Good Friday Healing School. You don't want to miss these incredible incredible sessions. They're so powerful. Yes, girls, I'm so I'm so proud of you. And maybe some of our viewers would like to go to your personal <laughs> websites or to your Instagrams. They both are world changers. They're activists in their in their area. And a uh, Paloma, tell us how we can follow Omi Omeo. <laughs> yes, you can follow me at Palomi, uh, P A L O M I E on Instagram, and you can follow Gia at genuinely Gia to see more about her ministry that she's created um, in helping the persecuted Christians throughout the world. Yeah, yes. and maybe Gia is going to talk to you just for a moment about March for the Martyrs and her incredible work for the martyrs. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so. Uh, this September 5th, September 5th of 2020, Labor Day weekend, we're going to be hosting the first ever March to Stand in Solidarity with the Persecuted Christians in the United States. So it's called March for the Martyrs, and I invite you to join us if you're in California. If you're not in California, I invite you to pray for us and stand in solidarity with the Persecuted Christians around the world. Connect with us on Instagram at March for the Martyrs. We love you. God bless you. Thank you for joining. Bye-bye. We love you.